Um, well, I think I'd like to start at the beginning, and we can move forward to this book. But I'd like to begin with um, your beginning. Can you tell me a little bit about how you came to be editing um, his books? What happened? It's very simple. My usual method. I was sent a manuscript, and I read it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Peters was sent to me by an agent I hadn't heard of, and he was just starting out. And in fact, I think he was your high school friend. My best friend remains my friend. Yep, Ralph Crespo, lovely guy. And um, yes, it was the reading that I uh, bought the book, I hope it was fun. And they supported me in doing so, and that was 1999. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was published in 2001, and uh, never looked back. <laughs> Beautiful reviews, beautiful quotes, beautiful everything, um, and it's been that way since. Mm -hmm. So. And uh, so you read the manuscript. What made you know that you wanted um, to publish it? You read it? Um, Was because I, I it, it it moved me, and um, you know, aside from just the writing, it was mm -hmm. um, I felt um, uh, well. It's hard to explain, I think. Um, but at, you know, I published Lydia Davis. I published Grace Perry. There's like very, you know, the realism, the emphasis on family, the uh, surprises. The um, uh, yeah, surprises are important too. Uh, but it was my kind of book, yes. And uh, and it was enough other people's kinds of books, book that it was quite successful. So. And Peter, what did you think when you first met Pat? What um, did you immediately know that you wanted her to publish your book? Was there any? Tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> I didn't have much choice at the time, I and mean, I was so surprised. That, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's generous, but I mean, Rob and I were, we didn't really know what we were doing, and my, you know, Rob just spent it, and, and you plucked it out of oblivion. And uh, I don't think we met for a long time, I think we talked on the phone a lot. Before you email, so before you use email, anyway. I, I learned about it six months later. <laughs> I remember being just uh, heartened by how calm Pat was. And the book took a long time from when it was accepted to when we started working on it. So it was a lot of, and so I had a lot of anxiety, but you would alleviate that anxiety frequently. I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> but I knew about Pat. I mean, I knew what her reputation was, so I knew how important Did you was. know any of the other writers that worked Of course, with yeah. yeah. I, personally? Oh, no, no, I mean, I knew them by <laughs> reference. And up to that point, had you been publishing stories? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think, um, I mean, I guess my break was the I had a month and published and published and published, so that uh, helped a great deal. But, you know, I've been publishing stories, you know, you know for, for a while, mm -hmm. so, and getting rejected constantly, <laughs> constantly. You did. You got rejected a long time before oh, yeah. you had your first one published? Sure, and this collection got rejected by everybody but. Oh, really? That happens a lot. <laughs> but then I'm the only bidder. I <laughs> <laughs> why, do you think, why do you think that is? I don't think it may be some, uh, people like what I like. I think sometimes um, it's a it's an effort to look for the commercial, or maybe the commercial is something which that you wouldn't necessarily think it was. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure I can you know, speak for myself. But, uh, I think it's good that I'll do my best to buy it. It seems as if um, in this book you've taken some of the um, things that you were doing to some extent in Mabala Chikanga and done them even more, if you know what I mean. Mabala Chikanga is in a way a series of vignettes, but not um, to the degree that this book is. And this book um, seems to move much more in time um, than that book did. It's a more intricate book. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that 
trajectory was like, and then also, Pat, what it was like to get in loan with that trajectory, um, which is, I, I, it seems as if it's more and more risk-taking. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we've always gone over the manuscript twice, um, because um, there, there is some shuffling that you like to do. I don't do it, Peter does it, and always makes it better. Um, with the order and the priorities, Markowitz wasn't the first scene to begin with. And I think it was a beautiful first scene, and that was Peter's shuffling. So I think we went through a, a first review, then Peter worked on the manuscript for maybe six months, not because of what I said, but because he was still thinking. Mm -hmm. And then I went through it again. I believe that was Christmas vacation 2010. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, it, it's, it's an evolving process. And so it's not, it's not like every other book that just like goes from A, B, C, D, and mm -hmm. then it's finished. You know? mm -hmm. So there's, it's, you know, it's an evolutionary process. Um, and I'm happy to say that his copy editor for three books, Lynn Warshaw, is here this evening. And there you are. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is here in person. Then it's freelancing now. I work with your insurance scouts, but I knew that you would have the sensitivity to not crash down on a sentence right that was purposeful. purpose for. <laughs> and she does, so it's been wonderful to have her. So I, I, the copy editing is a very important part of the process as well. Was the editorial process very different for these two novels, or similar? I mean, you said that he, um, you, Peter, reordered the, the sections in this book. Was that the case as well with Mavala Chikanga, or did you have more of a hand, Patty, in the larger kind of watering of the book? No, I don't usually have a large hand, because if I like the book, I think there's a reason that I like it, yeah. that it's the writer's mind, and that the writer's going to make up his mind about what's best, his or her. Here's a sample from my um, editorial letter. It's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, use italics as indicated for interior thoughts or dialogue, not accompanied by he said. Peter, use quotation marks, that's it. And it's like really exciting. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more than that. Mark up the manuscript a little bit for tone and repetition and things that only take slow reading. As far as structurally messing with a, a, a work of serious fiction, I think that's a little dangerous, actually. Um, you can do the wrong thing pretty easily. So. so tell me, Peter, how you came to structure the book in this way and what, what, um, what you were trying to get at with that almost constant movement. In, often in place, but always in time as well. Yeah, I mean, I just, I should say that Pat's small hand is a big hand to, to me. <laughs> um, you know, and, and a lot of times when, when, when Pat is making a small comment of what she might think is small, it, it, it rings very large to me, and that may well lead to a structural change that maybe Pat's not even always aware of. That's <laughs> I mean, I can think. Of, I have. I, have, I collected a few examples uh, because it happened a number of times, and and uh, just in, in knowing kind of what I was trying to do, and I didn't even know it. And, and cutting is a, is a huge thing. I like to cut a lot, and this book was horrifying to me because it get, kept getting longer. I, I never wanted to write a long book ever. It's, it's thick, um, and uh, uh, but I guess. Uh, when you asked about the difference in time, Marvel of Chicago is, uh, has, is, is a relatively static in the same time frame, but this book, I was bumping around in time, and I think that allowed me even more, had to have more fun with moving, with moving parts. And I think that, um, you know, I, I never know if anything works, but it seemed to me that I could, I could zoom in and out of time, and I could have my characters remember things from different time, periods of their life concurrently with their present life. Because basically Popper, the kid you just met, is remembering randomly throughout the book, even when it's not even from his perspective. He, in my view, he remembers for other people, uh, too. Um, 
but I, I thought that gave me a certain freedom to, to move around the time that I didn't quite know I had. Um, and, and, you know, and Pat allowed me that freedom, which I think a lot of editors wouldn't, wouldn't do to be really free. I think a lot of editors would have restrained. And I've seen it happen like, to my friends and myself. I mean, it, it happens. Editors sometimes want to write the book, too. <laughs> <laughs> or don't really understand what you're trying to do. For those of you who haven't read the book yet, it follows uh, actually four generations of uh, a family in Chicago um, and um, four relationships between um, They're not all marriages. Do, do Alexander and Pat actually get married? No, but, but, <laughs> but four relationships between a man and a woman in a really interesting way. Um, but it's also very much about place and um, about Chicago itself, evocative of Chicago and also of the um, North Shore and the suburbs of Chicago. And model of Chicago is you, the Nami Desert is such a character in that book too. Um, um, you are really interested in place a lot. Is that something that really attracted you to his work? Well, it interests me as well. Um, I, uh, my book generally have a very strong sense of place. I'm not sure why. I'm an expert. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Sharifa's book on Harlem. Uh, that's the whole place. I and mean, she has another place book to come. And uh, it does uh, tend to uh, influence us and, and define us in some way. So the, the, the review out of Chicago was really by a Chicago and a fellow Chicago and a novelist. And it was really, he pointed out things that, you know, I didn't know not being from Chicago, but how accurate and detailed and alive it is about the culture, the political system, the, the place, and the literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, he put references to Robert Frost all I missed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was really interesting. So that sometimes when the review stage comes, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. This is the um, a, a copy of public space. This is Peter's had a piece in there, and this is what Bridget does with such beautiful um, illustrations. And just so you see what it looks like, the truth was published there as well. Speaking of illustrations, can you tell me a little bit about the illustrations in the book? and what your discussions were about including those illustrations? Sure, my, my brother's a, a, a graphic artist, comic cartoonist, and uh, illustrator, and uh, I'd always wanted to work with him. He and I had worked on smaller projects together, um, but maybe after we bought the book, I, I thought it would be interesting to have drawings, and we negotiated for a while. My brother sent samples, and. Uh, my one criteria was is that there would be no people, and although there's some people in the train, there's some people running to the train. Um, <laughs> I let that slide, but um, but I didn't want uh, people. I wanted the book to have a certain, I guess, a certain loneliness that, that is captured by not having uh, souls in your in your drawings. But the drawings are really beautiful, and yeah. my brother and I um, talked a lot about them, and and Pat and, and Little Brown were kind enough to, uh, um, to think they were also good. And they put it on the cover, much to our surprise. I mean, we were totally, one day the cover came, came to you, right? And you, were, you had no idea. I had no idea they were using um, Eric's you know? drawing. It's just so great. Mm -hmm. So different from everything else. Mm -hmm. So is that unusual for you? Is it the first time you've done a novel that has had drawings in it like that? It is. Um, and, um, and again, they, they do have a size and place. You know, the piles of fish, the bird bars, you know, Cafe Tavern, the, they're, they're place markers in Chicago, but they're better than photographs in a way they get moved. And I think because my brother and I had the same childhood, sort of, I guess, I mean, he's five years older than me, but I, you know, I could say, like, I want the beach in November, Lake Michigan. I want it to be Millard's Beach, where we spent our whole lives. And, you know, he knew what I was talking about. It's not just in the way that he knew, he knew Millard's Beach, which only, you know, it's almost like, almost a family place, even though it's a public beach. But um, I could do that, and I could say, like, hey, I want this and this. And it was really fun to do. Mm -hmm. 
We drove each other crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I met so, Peter's brother and his mother when Peter got the Rome Prize from the Academy um, early on, so I felt it was sort of a family affair. And, uh, I like them both very much. <laughs> Good thing. Um, do you? Um, what is your approach path to, do you feel it's a unique experience with every writer you work with, or do you carry a certain kind of um, sensibility? I mean, obviously, it's, you're the same person editing all these writers, but what's your process in kind of working with a writer from writer to writer? Do you find it's very different that you react differently with Peter than you might react with another writer, or is the process similar? Similar. I think it's, you know, Peter's exact calm, that's not really true. <laughs> <My husband here. laughs> but um, it is important because I think the anxiety of being a writer must be stronger than just about any other possible anxiety. Maybe just because it's my field, but I can't imagine what it's like. And uh, you know, to just go public like that again and again. Um, so I think someone does have to be act as if it's not at all a worry. <laughs> and, Your voice uh, is calm. But it often, you know, it often isn't a worry. It's the book is good, you know, things happen. And we have, you know, beautiful reviews rolling in one week after publication, and uh, it's a very happy time right now. <coughs> but there are times when, you know, between edi editing or getting the galleries and the publication, it seems to switch on forever. And I think, especially for the writers, we can make a little small talk. <laughs> Here and there, um, but I, I really, um, I think I'm the same person with every writer, pretty much. And tell me, Peter, since Bridget is in the room, what the, how the editorial process differs working over a long project with Pat and then working on a story with Bridget? Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think, I think there, there's a commonality in, in the two editors and in, in incredibly close reading that will, they will catch just rhythm of things. I mean, Pat mentioned tone, and I think that um, that, that is, if, if an editor isn't with you on the tone, then, then I think you, you, you lose a, a great deal in your relationship. And uh, um, I've done a, a number of pieces with Bridget, and it's always, you know, <laughs> she'll, again, it's the light, I think, I mean, I think you sometimes feel that if, if it's a lighter touch, you're not, you know, but it's the light touch is what, what I think, I mean, and I've done some editing myself. I know when, if, if it's a slight nudge and you, you tell the writer to pay attention to a certain area or a certain sentence, then that's going to trigger maybe some better work. And uh, I've noticed that a lot in, uh, in, 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 in both. Um, in particular, Bridget mentioned that first piece. I think some of those, my obsessiveness, which I know is not uncommon at all for everything I've done, but in part is a response to maybe even a vibe I'm getting <laughs> from, from, from Bridget or, or Pat. So, um, and then I, I go from there. And my neuroses takes over and, and, and works on that point. Um, all of your books have been critically successful. So I was just wondering, Pat, you haven't needed really to champion them within the house. I, I wouldn't imagine. But do you often find yourself as an editor in that position of selling the book? internally and selling a second book by a writer if the first book hasn't quite lived up to the expectations um, in terms of sales? And how the selling is basically, I mean, for me, a matter of conveying how much you love the book. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing. Um, their sales works in their own ways, um, but if they start with genuine enthusiasm from the editor, things go a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are parameters. And uh, um, we've gone into a second printing already after one week. Yeah. So it's, it's um, they're seeing that, yeah. <laughs> it's doing very well. Yeah. Well, Little Brown is always, I, I think of Little Brown as a house that is publishing really good literary fiction and taking those yeah. kinds of... And they do pay attention to every book. Um, yeah. Not very grateful to begin. Mm -hmm. So, um, are you already working together on your next book? Pretty <laughs> 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 
I haven't asked you, Peter. Come in. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. I haven't asked you, Peter, the question that um, you just hinted at when you were talking about your brother, because I feel it's kind of a question that writers always get asked. But the book does seem a, um, as if it much more, well, maybe not much more, but it really is very much connected to your own childhood. Um, I know it's a work of fiction, but did you find it difficult to do that? Did you find it difficult to go back and mine your childhood in the way that you must have to create this character? Who is not you, I know. <laughs> I, I, uh, no, I, I think you hit it. I mean, I, I mean, I, I have a thought, a theory that I've been developing <laughs> over the last week, and that is that, uh, and I, I wonder, I'm not sure it's, I fully thought it out yet, so I'll save it, but I wonder if, if our autobiography is, isn't some of the biggest lies that we tell. <laughs> you know, and that, that if you're asked to actually tell about yourself, can you do it with a straight face? And, and uh, so this, this book tracks where I'm from and somewhat of my family configuration, but it's all, you know, I mean, I'm a professional liar. And, and so uh, I think to go into my own life and to lie about it was actually, I had more fun writing this than, than other books. And it, was, it seemed to come a little bit more naturally voice-wise because I, I, I got to go home and I haven't been home you know, since I was 18. And uh, so to go home in my head, which I desperately miss, I live in San Francisco, I desperately miss the Midwest. I, I feel, I just, I carry, I drag it around with me, you know, when I'm in San Francisco, which I don't even look at sometimes, and I, and the politics of San Francisco could not be duller. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and more, oh, God, we just had no mayor's election. Does anyone even know? I mean, you know, we're a pretty big city in San Francisco. You'd think it would be kind of big news, but not at all. Uh, so, um, I, I think, in that sense, it was um, a pleasure to go back to Lake Michigan, which is really what I, I was, I think I was trying to do here, and um, and it was also fun to lie and make, I mean, make people believe. I was actually talking about something that may be close to me, but it's always manipulated and always changed and always fictionalized. But I think it's, I think it's like a bigger, I mean, I think autobiography, my theory is, is autobiography is a bigger lie than other lies. That's my theory of the week. I don't know if it, it will hold up next week. So is that related to why you named the characters Popper? Uh, I, I, I I, well, I named the popper after Carl with, because of Carl Popper. You know, I I didn't. I I named the character Popper because of a of a Czech writer named Otto Pavel. Has anyone heard of Otto Pavel? He's a beautiful Ivan. He's got, he's a wonderful Czech uh, story writer who wrote a book called uh, How How I Learned to Fish. It's translated in various different ways, but. He, the reason I, I know about him is because I was in Prague at Kafka's grave, and there's a sign that points you to the right to Kafka's grave, and to the left to Otto Pavel's grave. And I was like, who's Otto Pavel? I mean, Kafka, Otto Pavel. So I, you know, I was, I went to Otto Pavel's grave. And I was curious. And I was like, who's this guy? Uh, and uh, um, and I since subsequently realized. He's published in English, the Storyline Press publishes a, a, a beautiful book that I mentioned about fishing. And uh, I started to read this guy, and he had a very interesting life. Um, and the reason I named Popper Popper is a little bit of a private homage to Otto Pavel. And the reason his name is not Popper, he changed his name to Otto Pavel, so I guess it would sound less Jewish, I think, as far as I understand it. But if you look at his grave, which is to the left when you go visit Kafka, you should, no one goes there. It's not a trod path at all. Uh, but his, on the gravestone, it says Otto Popper. So I was like, well, why, is the, why does the sign say Otto Pavel? Because everyone in the Czech Republic knows him as Otto Pavel, because if he's a revered writer who actually he went a little bit um, insane at the Winter Olympics in Austria in the 70s, but that's a whole longer story which I won't get into. But anyway, he's a, a hero of mine and I want to name him. That's very long. But then I realized that there's a, there's a, there's a uh, philosopher named uh, Karl Popper, yes. which I, who I didn't really know about yeah. until I started writing it and then I started reading Karl Popper. He's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. And he's known for his theories about 
falsification. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it, it, it was a lucky strike. <laughs> but he entered, Karl Popper enters the book because Kat, uh, Popper's girlfriend, knows who, Pop, who Karl Popper is, but uh, Popper doesn't know who Popper is. Karl Popper is. Does that make any sense? Yeah. <laughs> There's a great scene in the book too where Popper and Catter, um, he's read, uh, and she says some disparaging things about Saul Bellow. Um, and the book has a number, it feels like it references a number of Chicago writers. Was that purposeful? Sure, yeah. I, I, I mean, Saul Bellow, it's interesting. I think it was a very lucky thing for me to be born in a place that had been written about by such a such a wonderful, imaginative writer as Bellow was. And what I when I read Bellow, it's like my grandfather, who was born not who grew up and Bellow wasn't born in Chicago, he was born in Canada, but grew up uh, uh, nearby uh, Garfield Boulevard on the South Side. And it's as if if my grandfather was a writer and was a good storyteller, it might have it might have been that. So it was almost like I was being talked to by somebody. Who, who knew the things that my two generations in the past knew. And so, for me, Bellow is such a personal experience, as he is for so many people who've never been to Chicago. That's what's so remarkable about him. But, and I, but I wanted to take him down, because he, I think I revere him too much. So I had Kat who was like, because, you know, Bellow could be a blowhard. I, I mean, totally. He can go on and on and on. So, anyway, as I am doing. So. <laughs> You said that um, one of the things that you're interested in um, is a sense of place in books, it seems as if that's something across the board with your writers. What else um, do you really look for when a manuscript crosses your desk? Um, sentences. Mm -hmm. I, that I think make you stop and, and read a little more slowly and think a little harder and catch your attention and, and it's really true. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the arc of a story, I'm not that involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just my own my own um, uh, inclination. It's not I don't think it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just the way I've always read um, throughout my life. Yeah. A little more related to poetry than some prose, I'd say. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that usually means some concision, high points, just the high points. <laughs> and this isn't really a very long book. There's lots of white space. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Be, don't be intimidated. Yeah. Um, and also, um, I mean, several reviewers have commented on Peter's empathy with his characters, and mm -hmm. that that also draws me. Um, mm -hmm that there is uh, some feeling for the human condition <laughs> that's, um, that, that you can relate to. Mm -hmm. um, so those things sort of together are what I look for. And you know, sometimes you're surprised. You like something you didn't think you would like. But uh, um, oh, yeah. Ellen uh, uh, represents also the, both, both Peter, uh, Ellen Levine, and, and Daniel Ladrell. And one, uh, I don't know why I thought of this, but they were both nominated for the Fiction Prize, the LA Times Fiction Prize, and I was going out and Helen couldn't go. And she called me and said, now if Peter wins, turn to Daniel. <laughs> and if Daniel wins, turn to Peter. <laughs> and luckily in his real life, wanted to take him along. It was odd, I think. Um, but uh, Ellen seems to know what I like. I don't know why, but uh, she, she seems to like what I like. And, uh, you, you do get you know, relationships with certain agents who sort of think, oh, she'll like this. Right. I, you know, in some ways, I can't imagine more writers, um, writers more different than Daniel Woodrell than you. I mean, you write, everything is different. And yet, that when you mention Daniel again, I immediately got what you love in books, because the similarity is there's nothing similar, but there's Something underlying that's so similar. Language, language, place. place um, um, people who need some help and vulnerable people often. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the girl is so funny. I mean, we were talking about this at dinner that people think that. 
Daniel Joe is so dark, and he, he's certainly dark. I mean, <laughs> the stuff that happens in his books is dark, but, but he's also, his, his sense of, his comic timing is so wonderful. But that's so. true of you, too. Oh, this is yeah. a very funny book, yeah. as well. Yeah. Yes. A very funny book. And at first, when I was reading it, I, I got to the first thing where I laughed out loud, and then I thought, Wait, am I supposed to be happy? <laughs> they thought, yeah, I am, I am. <laughs> so, so I think you have that in common as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so incredibly moving, but funny, and, um, and surprising. That's the other thing that these writers have in common, that you're, you're moving along through the book, and then it turns, and it surprises you. That kept happening to me over and over again while I was reading this book. So that the expectation is set up for one thing, and this is why you must read this immediately, <laughs> one of the many reasons, but the expectation is set up for one thing or some, one kind of response, and then, and then it turns, and you're surprised. Surprised not only by what happens, but by the language used to describe what happens. Um, and, was, and is that something that's always been present in your writing, that desire to sort of... Um, it's not a trick. It's not a trick at all. It's, it's, it comes it's, natural. Yeah, it's the, yeah, it's the desire to sort of um, confound the reader's expectations and bring them to another place.